Hey everybody, I am Rogue Link, and this is designing a speedrun from the ground up. Uh, first with the introductions, I've been making games in at least some capacity for the last eight years. I'm currently employed at Telltale Games, and I am working on my own indie precision platformer called Radio Run. Uh, more about that at the end. Uh, but the more relevant information, at least things you guys probably already know about me. Speedruns, I'm Roguelink on Twitch. Uh, I'm the world record holder for Gargoyles Quest and the version of GQ2 that nobody else runs, except for Maid. <laughs> Former world record holder of Gargoyles Quest 2. And some other stuff I've done speedruns on is Demon's Crest, Shantae in the Pirate's Curse, which may have had a run yesterday. Uh, so I heard, it was pretty great, I was on the couch. Um, Celeste, very briefly, and Minute, also briefly, but I'm better at Minute than I am Celeste, that's for sure. So what are we talking about today? Um, I'm going to be looking at game features from games that I've done speedruns of, um, good and bad, so looking at good examples from games that I've speedrun, bad examples from games that I've speedrun, um, all that good stuff. I've done mostly platformers. Uh, so with a couple exceptions, I'm going to be focusing on those. So I'm working on a platformer. I have more experience with platformers, so I wanted to keep it fairly relevant there. And how we can apply some of those lessons learned to new design. So I'm not just going to be tearing into some of my old speed games or whatnot. I'm going to be presenting proposals of how the design could have changed, how we could improve it, how you could uh, take the flaws, twist them a little bit, and maybe even write a whole game behind it. So few things, movement, punishment, randomness. We're gonna open up with movement. So for me, movement makes or breaks a speed run. I don't know about you, but if the movement is off, I usually just don't care. <laughs> and I want it to be super tight, super precise. Um, when you push the button, you want it to go. When you stop pushing the button, you want it to stop as soon as humanly possible. One of the biggest complaints I ever hear about speedruns is, you know, take off screaming at Bubsy, for instance. He stops moving and he slides off the platform because Bubsy didn't stop. So character drift. Movement variety is a big one. Um, going over that more in a, in, a, in a little bit. Obstacle variety. How are you going to use that movement throughout the levels? And, you know, crazier controls require crazier design. So you can totally do something really weird, but it's going to take a longer tutorial, and it's going to be a lot harder to teach the player, okay, this is the cool thing. You know, might be a longer game. You might have a lot of ramp up. It's just something you have to take into consideration. Um, but you can definitely do some crazy stuff so long as your design and, uh, and obstacles support it. So I'm going to start with Shantae. So developed by WayForward 20. 14, released on a wide variety of platforms over a wide variety of years. Uh, most recently came out on the Switch. Uh, it's the third game in the Shantae series. Uh, it's a Metroidvania, though I've had some people argue that point with me. Um, I still kind of think it's a Metroidvania with uh, slowly unlocking its movement mechanics and backtracking, exploring, all that good stuff. It's just it's broken up in such a way that some people wouldn't say it's a Metroidvania. And most importantly, it has pirate mode which means all of the cool stuff is unlocked. And you might be asking, hey, Rogue, what is that cool stuff? Well, you've got the hat, the sword, the dash, and the cannonball. So a lot of really fast movement options. And I think the most important thing about Shantae that we can look at is everything you do is incredibly fast-paced. The only one of these movement abilities that stops your momentum is the sword. And that makes the sword really, really good at stopping exactly on a very specific point or traveling downward very quickly. So you're able to maintain momentum and channel that momentum throughout um, a variety of levels. And Shantae doesn't have the most unique obstacles. Like it's got death pits and it's got lava and it's got spikes, you know, all that good stuff. But really, I've found that the unique character of the Shantae levels comes more from starting with the movement mechanics. So the, the level that you unlock the dash, it's always very long and sprawling level, that kind of thing. Um, 
and you're able to uh, really set a lot of stuff up. You do have attacks that slow down the character, so there's this very interesting risk reward of, okay, there's an enemy in my way, what am I going to do? Am I going to attack it? Am I going to stop it? But again, with the maintaining momentum, the dash is really good because guess what? You're invulnerable during that whole thing. And even just the first level in Shantae and Pirate Mode where you have everything unlocked is this super fast-paced, crazy-looking run. Like the first time I saw a Shantae speedrun, I wanted to do it immediately because I thought they were doing some crazy stuff. But turns out that's just the basic movement mechanics just look really good and are fantastic to speedrun, especially when you have them right out of the gate. Uh, next up is Celeste, also another one of my favorite uh, movements in games recently. Uh, it was announced, or it was released this year, uh, another precision platformer by Matt Makes Games. Uh, has a very interesting dash mechanic, and Matt's actually talked about this a lot in his uh, GDC talks as well as other things. They had an everything is intended philosophy where they actually found bugs, and, and you can look it up. It's a 2017 uh, GDC talk uh, by Matt. It's uh, free on YouTube, one of the public talks. It's really great, really great watch. Uh, they had a everything is intended mentality where they found bugs during development, took them away, and then made them easier to do because they realized they just added that much to the movement mechanics during the game. And Celeste has some pretty, some pretty neat stuff. Uh, shout outs to uh, Oddbod and the first advanced movement tutorial for Celeste. Um, that's where I got all of these recordings for the, the GIFs and stuff for. Um, so you have the basic midair dash and the, the grab, which is for your casual playthrough, all you need to get through. But then there's also crazy stuff like the hyper jump and the uh, dash cancel, I believe, where one of them is faster, but you stay lower to the ground, and one of them is longer distance, but gets more vertical height. So they have this very interesting uh, flexibility. And then it gets even weirder where you can do things like the wave dash, where you actually gain the ability to dash super fast, and then you can still dash midair. Um, this was something they discovered mid-development and then just decided to run with it, which I think is a really great uh, mentality for speedrunning and speedrunning development because then you're able to take this stuff that your community thinks really cool is really cool and that your testers think is really cool and build stuff around it. Uh, they found this stuff mid-development and uh, in, uh, Celeste, in case you don't know, there's the basic levels, there's the B-sides, and there's the C-sides. And the basic levels you can get through with just the normal dash mechanics and so on and so forth. Obviously, it's faster to go through with the advanced mechanics, more on that in a, in a little bit. But the hard levels, they said, hey, we have these cool new mechanics we found during development. Let's make some really hard levels for, like, five people. <laughs> and turns out just everyone, everyone loved them because it's a really, really easy game to pick up and just ramps you up as far as you want. And yeah, you can also do the, uh, the delayed dash as well. So instead of wave dashing into the ground, which is kind of the casual introductory way of doing it, you're actually able to just time it perfectly, which is something you're probably going to see TGH doing like crazy when this game is run uh, later this week. I don't remember what day it's on, but here's going back to what I was talking about. So this is the intended way to go through this level, um, how most people would see this. And if you'd never seen the Shantae speedrun or have nothing about it, you'd think this is pretty normal. Yeah, this is this is what I'm supposed to do. There's no way I can get over that lower gap. Um, but turns out, if you know how to hyper dash, you can just cruise throughout the bottom of the level. And again, in Matt's GDC talk, he actually does a really good, he has a really good section on how we tweaked the levels to actually make some of this easier to do. So originally, uh, Originally, it was just supposed to be underneath, if I, if I remember correctly, and then tweak back and forth, back and forth. But the intention is to reward skilled players by giving them options to do this advanced movement, but still have an ability and the option for casual players to go through. So I, I believe in the talk, Matt, ac Matt actually mentions uh, doing passes through the level to make sure that some of these screens have multiple ways to go through them, which I think is a a really cool design philosophy. Uh, next up as a kind of bad example, not bad, but just not 
not my favorite, is uh, Demon's Crest, uh, developed by Capcom, released in 1994. Uh, third and final game of the Gargoyles Quest series, and it actually has a very wide variety of forms and attacks. So you might be thinking, oh, this is great. Like, look at all that stuff. You've got uh, an air gargoyle form, a uh, super powerful gargoyle, another super powerful gargoyle, a uh, ground gargoyle where you can dash, and a water gargoyle. So it has a lot of situations where you can... Um, gives you the, the basic movement and stuff like that and a lot of variety. But the problem comes into the interesting thing for me at least, and I think a lot of people find it interesting, is the uh, limitations I find more interesting than strengths when it comes to speed running design and just platformer development in general. Because Demon's Crest has an infinite flight strength right out of the gate, and you're able to literally just fly over the first level. It's not even something that you would cleverly find out in a speed run, but you don't even have to engage with the enemies because you're just too powerful out of the gate. Um, not only that, but the game has all of these cool power-ups and abilities and stuff, and we barely use any of these. Um, you use the tornado a tiny bit, which is um, the one in the center on the top row, and you mostly use those abilities, but every time you want to switch, anytime you want to do anything, you have to pause, take like five hours to open up this menu, select the thing you want, realize you selected the wrong thing, open the menu again, <laughs> close it, and then you end up right back here. So how can we improve this? What can we do? Um, well, I think taking Shantae as an example, it really applies here, where we could make a form or a version that you can very quickly use every ability at the press of a button or something like that. Um, Shantae is really, really interesting here because every single side ability that Shantae does is at the single press of a button. Um, of the four or five abilities that you can do, each one is a unique button press, each one is a unique button ability. They slowly learn over the course of the game and you're able to quickly adapt. But in Gargoyle's Quest, it gives you all of this cool stuff that you just don't care about. Um, even in the boss rush category, which is um, probably one of the least run categories in Demon's Crest, you unlock all of this stuff and you use basically none of it. Um, the ultimate form gives you the ability to transform and swap and just do all of, all of your abilities but you don't use any of your special attacks, you don't use any of your abilities, but I think there's ways we could fix this. Um, say we took Demon's Crest and presented it like Shantae. We want to design it like Shantae. I'd probably make Firebrand have limited wing strength, like the first two Gargoyles quest games. Um, possibly uh, allow you to rotate through the, so through the, the forms more quickly, like with an L and R, sort of press. Uh, usually when you're rotating through L and R though, you'd have to keep in mind uh, how many things you're sorting through. Usually if it's more than three, three is kind of a magic number. Because if it's three different forms, for instance, you have the current form you're on, L toggles you to one form, R to toggles you to another form. You don't have to worry about shifting through a form that you don't want. It's a real quick, instantaneous button press of I am now on what I want, I am now doing the cool thing. So I would probably have maybe one or two different types of attacks. Maybe like the, uh, just as an example, we could have the claw, which is the fourth one from the right. It's a common uh, Gargoyles quest ability where you can launch it and it will uh, hit spiked walls and it makes a temporary platform, which is really cool in the original Gargoyles quest, but you just don't need it because your one of your forms in Demon's Crest is you can just fly forever, even more forever than you could before. And it uh, really takes some interesting level designs and just you're, you're too powerful. But one thing Demon's Crest is really good at is punishment. And I think punishment is really good for um, getting new players into the speed run. So in Demon's Crest, you always go back to the start of the previous room, which is fantastic. Um, with minimal loss of progress, you're able to make up for some... Um, you're able to make a minor mistake, which is fine. The last thing you want is for something to be like a, a nine hour run 
an RNG or like a tiny mistake just ruins everything for you. Uh, the original Gargoyles quest was is is pretty bad about that. Um, that's actually one of my examples coming up. But you want to make sure that you don't lose that much progress because not only is that going to make it a better casual experience, but it means that the extreme punishment will allow new runners to finish more runs right out of the gate. It will mean they can experiment during a run while they're learning the game, maybe even find some new crazy stuff that you wouldn't expect them to. Um, and it allows more runs to be completed. It's more marathon safe, which is, you could say that could go one way or another. Marathon safety and tension is kind of tied together, but I definitely think that a minimal loss of progress can at the very least help with a long-term sort of running thing. And crit path checkpoints is something I really like. Uh, nothing kills the speed run faster than checkpoints that are super far out of the way or just inconvenient to access. Um, Minute is really good about this. Um, developed by Lambeer also earlier this year. It's a very, very unique sort of adventure game, very akin to Zelda, where it's kind of like a Zelda game, but in one minute bite-sized chunks. Um, it's really neat if you haven't heard about it. Uh, basically, you have, once you pick up the sword at the very beginning of the game, you have 60 seconds to do anything. There's uh, checkpoints throughout the game, so you can kind of change your spawn point, but everything is in one-minute bite-sized chunks. Um, it's a really interesting way to explore with this sort of tension. Um, it kind of always feels like a speed run, which is a really interesting point, because you're always racing the clock no matter what you do. And there's some really, really clever design um, that they do. For instance, one of the first NPCs that you see literally takes five seconds to get to and has dialogue lasting 50 seconds, <laughs> just telling you where one hidden item is. And it's, it's genius, because you take this time limit and you're like, okay, here's a bunch of stuff within reach, and here's this one really slow talking turtle that will just not get to the point. <laughs> and then he, then he does eventually, it's great. Um, but you're able to um, explore quite a bit, like I was saying, and if you make a mistake, you know exactly how much time you're losing. You lose a minute. That's why the game's called Minute, you lose minute. You lose a, a minute for everything. So when you're first doing the run, it's very good at um, easing you into it, for lack of a better term. Uh, there's even, I, I'm even pretty sure that they took a lot of this into account in terms of speedrunning modes and, and stuff like that, because uh, there's something that you can pick up very early on, which is a flashlight, which is super useful, because you can see in the dark, except it's slow. And every single room in the game, or sorry, not every single room in the game, but there's two rooms in the basic game that you can get through that are kind of challenging, not terrible. You can use audio cues to get through without the flashlight. So it's this really cool exploration thing of, oh man, I'm going to do this high risk thing and I'm definitely going to be rewarded for it. Uh, what makes me think that the developers thought of this from the ground up is in second run mode, which is kind of like New Game Plus, you realize just how many lanterns were in the game because there aren't any <laughs> in the second mode. So everything is just super difficult and they say, oh, you still don't want to get the flashlight? Good luck, buddy. <laughs> Let's see how you do. And it's, it's really, really clever um, at the very least. And again, Celeste is another fantastic advan uh, example in regarding to this with uh, punishment. Um, Celeste has very bite-sized, isolated uh, chunks or, or levels, and you always respawn at the start of those levels, which is really, really convenient. You can be powering through, you can make a mistake, you can hit a very difficult room, but you can always guarantee, no matter what crazy stuff you try in the room, that you're always going to go back to the start. You're always going to spawn where you jumped in. Um, Celeste is also really good for like long-term practice progression too, because there are certain points throughout the level where if you exit out of the level and you come back, you maintain a little bit of progress. You maintain those, those checkpoints. So that's a really good casual experience as well, because Celeste can get pretty frustrating. It's 
not an easy game. Um, but casual players and speedrunners are able to leave and come back, and this also means that it's really good for practice. Um, instead of having to make a billion save states or this and that, uh, Celeste allows you to start the level, start at uh, not any of the small level chunks, but it usually breaks the levels into three or five or more segments, depending on how long the, the level is. The, the summit, for instance, is more of a themed thing that plays on all the previous levels, and that has a lot more checkpoints. But um, in this particular case, especially when it comes to practice, at least someone's going to want to start somewhere. So having a lot of flexibility in terms of where they can start is a pretty good idea. And because there's so many checkpoints, you have this natural improvement of just die less. You know, you're going through this super difficult game. It's not a matter of nailing that one trick, which is still really cool, but I find it's kind of hard to force those in without just making the game incredibly difficult. Um, again, the casual, ex a good casual experience will usually lead to a good speedrunning experience, at least in my opinion, because a lot of what makes a good game makes a good, high-polished, good, high-movement speedrun. And now for my favorite speedrun ever. It has some flaws. It's Gargoyles Quest, developed by Capcom, 1990, on the Game Boy, the original game of the Gargoyles Quest series. Uh, it has a limited hover mechanic, which I find absolutely enchanting, with uh, wall climbing to traverse levels. And a lot of its limitations you can really track back to the original Game Boy hardware. And this is Firebrand, isn't he great? So the problem with Gargoyles Quest, I could probably have a whole panel on Gargoyles Quest, but we're not gonna do that. Um, you, it has a really bad difficulty curve. Like, really, really bad difficulty curve. Literally, the first, the first two levels are the hardest in the entire game because you cannot take any damage at all. It's not even a matter of oh, this is efficiently routed, or this or that. There's, there's one spot in the first level where you could take damage or not, but most of the Gargoyles Quest speedrun comes down to how much health do I have for the final boss, for the, the boss of the level, and how easy it is for me to use my iframes in order to mash through it. So just on the micro level of the levels themselves, they are incredibly difficult. And the end of the game is usually incredibly easy because you have infinite wing strength, you've got all this health. Um, you are really hard to kill. Again, comes back to the limitations of, the interest of limitations as opposed to the limit interest of strength. Um, Celeste, going back to Celeste, you die in one hit, but it checkpoints really often. So you still have that satisfying tension of, if I touch anything, I'm done but you don't actually go back that far. So it's a lot of interesting repetition. Uh, the other problem with Gargoyles Quest is the checkpoints are really, really far apart. Um, you not only have to go way out of your way, wasting, I think you would waste, I've, I've never actually timed it, but I think you'd waste at least a minute or two per checkpoint that you try to get. And if you die, you go back quite a ways. So not only do you waste several minutes with this safety, but if you don't use that safety, you waste even more time trying to trek back to the level, this and that, this and that. So uh, another point for more direct checkpoints. Uh, even when the checkpoints are on your way, if you have to stop, like Shantae as an example, uh, you run straight past the checkpoint people but since it doesn't automatically save or anything, if you die, you go back to literally the only forced save in the game, and that's, that's kind of rough. But how can we improve this? How can we improve Gargoyle's Quest? Well, um, high risk, high reward gives a lot of uh, routing opportunity in terms of checkpoints and things. Uh, as I was writing this uh, panel, I was really intrigued by the idea of a, of a game that was purely designed around death warping. So in Gargoyles Quest, there's a handful of, well, there's a single death warp, now that I think about it. Um, there's a lot more in Gargoyles Quest 2, just in terms of where the uh, checkpoints are stored and things like that. Um, 
but I think it would be really interesting to have a game that has checkpoints all over the place, but every time you die, it always maintains your progress. So it's just this interesting game of, okay, how far away can I get? What about this? What about that? And then you have this really interesting point of, okay, I die, where do I go? Maybe even, which I'm literally just thinking of right now, what if we combined Celeste and Gargoyle's Quest where you die, you maintain all of your progress, but you can choose the point that you warp back to. So it's still all of this automated checkpoints. You're still able to very gradually work your way through a level. But since you maintain your progress on death, you can be like, okay, so we died here, we're going here, let's warp here. Okay, now we're going to hurl ourselves into that pit, and then we can go there. So then you kind of have this combination of um, a lot of tension from instant kill spikes, theoretically, and um, this interesting routing challenge of go here, go here, go here, go here, go here. So I think it would lend itself to a really open world game, like, say, um, Link Between Worlds. You know, where the order in which you acquire items is really up to you. Um, I think that would be a, a really interesting design challenge to take one of those speedrunning concepts and just run with it like crazy for more than just a platformer. Randomness. Yeah, Gargoyle's Quest isn't really good at randomness either, but uh, I figured it would be useful, re really good for, for where I used it. So randomness is a touchy subject in the speedrunning community. Most people would probably argue that you just get rid of it entirely, but I think it has some uses. It definitely adds some flavor and replay value to your content, uh, and, and it allows you to have, to stretch out your content. As long as you're not doing it in an unfair or really tedious way, randomness can add a little bit of flavor to what content you already have. Like take roguelikes, for example. They thrive on procedural gener generation. Um, but I think what people really hate about randomness is the extreme differences from one randomly determined result versus another. Um, like say losing several minutes because a boss happened to be out of reach or a boss happened to be doing this particular attack form and that particular attack just happens to take an hour for some reason. Like, imagine Knights of the Realm happening 12 times randomly during any RPG run, and I think you'd drive a speedrunner insane. But I think as long as you can control the randomness one way or the other, it could be really interesting. Like, for instance, if you have a roguelike or something along the lines, if you have a way to input the seed, if you can race that randomness, I think your randomness is, is correct. Um, well, correct heavy air quotes. There's no correct, it's game design, it's fluid, you know, you can do what you want, and I almost guarantee at least one person will like it. <laughs> There's someone out there who will like it, but you, you know, selling your games is a completely different talk that I'm not qualified to give. <laughs> um, so key factor, roguelike, procedural generation, just make sure you can have some sort of seed input. And you can't talk about randomness without Link to the Past Randomizer. Which, considering its absolutely crazy popularity, I really want to include in here somehow. So, Link to the Past was developed by Nintendo in 1991. And the first randomizer, as far as I could tell, was developed in 2016, still constantly being updated, has tournaments all over the place. And just as a bare bones example, if you haven't heard of randomizer, Link to the Past Randomizer, it randomizes the content within all of the chests throughout the entire game to even extreme degrees with such as key sanity, which randomizes the location of all keys for all dungeons all over the place. And why would you ever do that? But I totally see the appeal. <laughs> and again, like key sanity versus the normal generation, you've got multiple forms of this kind of procedural generation. Um, and it, it gives you a lot of routing opportunity. So one of the biggest comments that I've heard from a few people, uh, even people who originally didn't like Randomizer, but then got into it, didn't realize how good it is at, say, improving your technical expertise or your, your routing, where you can do some 
um, randomizer runs, and it puts you in situations that you don't really expect. It makes you just uncomfortable enough where it adds some intrigue or tension where there wouldn't usually be any intrigue or tension. Um, I think a lot of people like seeing this in a Zelda game um, even self-inflicted upon things like three heart runs. Who's done a three heart run in Zelda? Like, a lot of people have done a three heart run in Zelda. I'm even personally doing what I'm referring to as a that's way too hard why run of Breath of the Wild where I'm forcing myself to not upgrade any equipment and I'm not picking up hearts and I'm on hard mode and everyone has asked why I'm doing this and I can't give them a good answer. Um, but it's so much fun. <laughs> And the, the Zelda, Zelda logic is just really, really good at this kind of intrigue. Uh, the joke that I make to a lot of people all the time is Link to the Past randomizer just turns that game into Link Between Worlds. And those two games are both really, really good. The only difference is in Link Between Worlds, you can actually choose which item you get. You could probably basically make your own Link to the Past randomizer in Link Between Worlds if you roll the dice for which item you got next. I bet it would be pretty close. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's interesting. And, you know, you complete objectives in ways that you wouldn't expect. And it's, it's, it's pretty neat. You know, you don't know where everything is guaranteed. And I'd really like to see um, if people would find uh, Link to the Past Randomizer sort of applied with, like, a roguelike mentality at all, where you know where things are and you try to like optimize that seed as much as possible i don't think the i don't know if the randomizer community would uh do that because i'm not very familiar with the community as a whole but i think just trying to take a really weird seed and just trying to optimize it would be really interesting like i heard about someone uh, a couple months ago who was trying to take the theoretical best possible seed for randomizer, which was basically putting every key item in the game in one place just to see how fast it could possibly be. I'd really like seeing to see someone do the opposite of that, put everything in the most inconvenient spot possible and try to optimize that seed or just like fine tune where things are and optimize that. I think that could be pretty interesting. Uh, another interesting example of randomness is Gargoyles Quest 2 Game Boy. Um, Again, not the most well-known Gargoyles Quest game. Uh, it's a remake of the Gargoyles Quest 2 game made in the original Game Boy Engine, released in 1993 in only Japan. I think it's the only Japan aspect that a lot of people don't recognize. But they took a lot from the first two Gargoyles Quest games and improved them drastically, especially in the terms of RNG. Um, you can argue that what they did was remove randomness, but it actually took me quite a few runs and quite a bit of routing to realize that the randomness wasn't there. So it's almost a way to um, harness where people expect the randomness to be and still use it so that you have that dynamic um, behavior that people would expect from randomness, such as boss battles or whatever, but put it in a situation where if given enough time and uh, implementation, it can be manipulatable. So when I was first picking up Gargoyles Quest 2 Game Boy, I actually thought all of the bosses, bosses had random behavior because that's what it was in previous games and previous releases. Um, I was too busy excited that there were no Gargoyles Quest 1 random encounters to really notice that there was actually minimal RNG just as a whole throughout the whole game. Um, Bosses appear to be random, but everything ends up being distance-based. If you have uh, very precise inputs over your um, attacks and what how much life they have left and how far away you are from them, all but, I think, one of the bosses can be almost completely manipulated. Uh, some bosses are more difficult than others, which I think is a really good way of sort of tweaking that difficulty. Uh, if you're going all in on making your game for a speedrun, it's an interesting concept where your difficulty curve includes routing and includes uh, boss manipulation. So you you know start out, it's super easy to ma manipulate the boss. He always does the same thing every time. Then you have to have like very precise distancing, and then you have to have very precise damage, or you know something along those lines. Just things you can play with. 
Um, I think the general concepts of speedrunning and what people look for, what people do in order to route a speedrun is an interesting concept for design in a lot of these cases. And Demon's Crest. Back to Demon's Crest. There's a, there's a reason why I stopped running this game. It's because it was driving me crazy. And then I picked up Shantae, and now I'm happy. <laughs> but uh, Gargoyle's Quest, or Demon's Crest bosses, are probably the most infuriating RNG that I've ever encountered in a game. And that includes Gargoyle's Quest 1 RNG, which is literally just wasting several minutes. Um, at least Gargoyle's Quest 1 RNG, the random encounters are interesting. They're engaging. You're doing something. Um, I've done those encounters so many times that they're hyper-optimized to the point where they shouldn't be, because you shouldn't be seeing them at all. But in Demon's Crest, all the boss randomization means you can't hit it for long periods of time. And there's nothing worse than not being able to hit that giant boss flying in the sky because he just won't come down and he keeps shooting those orbs and he just won't drop down in attack range. Um, this is even the not so bad version of this fight. The, uh, the second version, Arma, he's the, he's the one on the right who I was referencing. He has a green version, which the community jokes as is Arma Verde, um, where he has even more attacks where he can't be hit. And why would you do this to me, Capcom? Um, but they have so many boss patterns where you just can't hit anything. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of waiting. It's a lot of sitting on your hands. And I think that's the last thing you want the randomness to do. I think you want the randomness to do different attacks. You want the randomness to engage the players in different ways, keep them on their toes, but you don't want it to just completely lock them out of doing absolutely anything to progress. Um, I find in most cases that's just frustrating and I don't think you'd, you'd want to do it <laughs> as either a developer perspective or a um, gameplay perspective. But, you know, looking back at when this game came out, they were probably trying to stretch the content out a little more. They were trying to make the games look cinematic. This is the best Firebrand had ever looked at this time. Um, it's the most pixels they've ever had. They wanted to use them. <laughs> It looks fancy. I can't argue that this doesn't look fancy. I mean, look at those scrolling backgrounds. They look so good. Um, but how can, we, how can we improve this? Um, I think this could be very easily improved by just doing one tiny thing. Take Arma on the right side and just shift him down like 10 pixels. That's all they needed to do. Because um, I think the most frustrating thing about Arma and Hippogriff on the left side is it's not only that they're they're out of reach it's that they're just barely out of reach um, like your maximum jump height and then you shoot your attack and they can barely get anywhere so you want to avoid that kind of frustrating stall that just sitting on your hands and waiting as I was talking about so instead of sitting on your hands and waiting for that opening to happen again maybe add more um, just add more openings Make it so that they have, they're easier to read. Make it so that they have this like big, large charge up time. Make it so that they just do anything, but make it so that you can't hit them. So that people aren't sitting on their hands. I know I was kind of drilling that, that point home, but arm is really frustrating. <laughs> um, but that's, that's pretty much it for, for randomness. Now, other stuff. Um, I just had some stuff noted down. Um, I don't really have a full slide for this. Oh, I do have a full slide for this. I forgot. Um, just just little things. Um, things I've noticed over time, sometimes with things that I've run, sometimes I, things I haven't run. Uh, In-game time is just a nice to have uh, for a lot of speedrunning games, I noticed, especially if it's a good in-game time. Like Celeste, the, some of the first patches for Celeste were improving the in-game time and making it more accurate and helping it match RTA um, so that they would be encouraged to just use that in-game and not have to worry about it. Um, and Minute also has a really good in-game time of you know exactly when the timer's turning on, you know exactly how it works, it's only running during the parts you care about for the run, and you can always tell when a game has a good in-game timer because they prefer to use the in-game timer. 
uh, in terms of a speed running timing as opposed to RTA. Another really good version, another really good example is consistency between versions. I think the best example I've seen for this is Wonder Boy, actually. Uh, Wonder Boy and the Dragon's Trap, where almost all of their versions are like very, very close to each other. And the developers even tried to keep the different versions as close as possible so that if different people wanted to play or race or whatever at the same time, they were able to do so pretty easily. And fast text scrolling. Um, so some of you might have known of the donation incentive yesterday for Shantae, where every extra menu we were donating $10, and JT paused eight times. <laughs> yeah, I made a pretty big donation last night. Um, I even bumped it up to just be eligible for the grand prize. <laughs> um, so the, the real big thing with this is there's a, there's a couple ways you can approach this. Uh, Celeste just allows you to skip cutscenes altogether, which I think is a really clean cut approach. It's an extra menu. It's not actually that bad. It's a consistent menu. You can always tell when the cutscene's happening. It's not like it sneaks in on you or anything because it does, you know, the super cinematic bars and all that good stuff. Um, or you could do what I kind of prefer, or kind of at least tolerate, which is. Uh, Gargoyles Quest 2 Game Boy, you hold the button down and then you tap to finish the dialogue, which I think is nice. It's not as mashy as, say, Gargoyles Quest where you're just mashing through everything. Um, at least in Gargoyles Quest, you can mash B or A, and if you mash B, then you don't have to risk opening up a menu, uh, which is really nice. Or even just pretend you have turbo on and just hold A, you know? If it's a, I think that's a really good example of if some games only have turbo to go through text, that usually mean that game has a problem. And turbo fixes that problem. Maybe consider implementing that solution just from the ground up. And then probably the worst case scenario is Shantae, only because it changes what the button does. So you can't mash it. And you only need to hit it once. So it's just this really awkward thing of, you wanna make sure your buttons always do the same thing one way or another. And if you're changing that state, you wanna make sure, like going from cutscene to not cutscene, you wanna make sure pausing that button doesn't inadvertently do something else. Now, Gargoyle's Quest kinda has that problem, but with, if you mash A, because A opens the menu, because it's a different menu from the start menu. Um, but Shantae's the, the really bad one, since it's a completely different menu that you don't even need to open, you have no other options for skipping this text. So it's just kind of awkward. So maybe just hold A to skip your text or have it skip cutscene, that kind of thing. But let's pull this all together. So I'm currently working on a game called Radio Run, which I mentioned early on in the game. So bringing it all together. Uh, the main mechanic of Radio Run, the very baseline thing that I started with was I want to make a procedural Gargoyles Quest game that feels like a speedrun. So it's got a uh, limited hover mechanic. You're actively racing against the clock. Um, I wanted to make sure you had the replayability of wanting to do this multiple times. Um, you know, leaderboards kind of like Spelunky where you can have dailies or just keep track of things. Very beginner friendly. You know, easy to learn, difficult to master is a phrase that's thrown around a lot. Um, I think that's a lot harder to implement than people give it credit for. But at the very least, being beginner friendly, not immediately picking them up and then smashing them on the ground right after the tutorial. Um, you know, it's, it's nice. But it's supposed to feel like a speed run so much as be designed and intended for speed running. Um, it's got some interesting movements. So like I said, it has Gargoyles Quest inspired hovers. And I actually spent like two months figuring out how to make wall jumps work. <laughs> Not so much from an implementation perspective, so much as uh, doing surveys, uh, implementing it in game, um, seeing what works, doing some user testing, doing some back and forth. And the biggest problem I ran into was making the, uh, comparing making the walls feel sticky 
versus making the walls easy to fall off, off of. Because the less sticky your wall is, and this might sound a little counterintuitive, the less sticky your wall is, the harder it is to do a wall jump, depending on how you do your wall jump. So if you immediately unregister the person of being on the wall to be super technical, then you have to, then you're forcing them to hold against the wall and then jump off and then they change direction and then they have to immediately change the direction and then it's, it's really weird. But I found Mega Man X is actually a really good inspiration for, for wall jumps and just wall interaction in general. Um, oh, by the way, this is Charlie and that's his little clock companion, Lima, the local investigative mechanic assistant. I was really proud when I came up with that, uh, that name. But it's radio run, so the, oh, to back, back up a tiny bit, the, the running theme is uh, you're chasing this alien radio signal from a crashed alien ship that you watched enter the atmosphere. So all of the names are um, alpha phonetic, or NATO alpha phonetic characters. So Charlie's the main character, Lima's the little clock following you, Sierra's a character, um, you know, things like that. And it's got uh, little chunks that similar to Celeste with its little bite-sized pieces, but I'm stitching a lot of these together in order to um, build the whole level. More on that later. And while the first couple of stages, the first area, are more linear, um, later areas are going to have you know, a player choice. Do you want to take the shorter path that's more technical, that you risk restarting at the start of the area, or do you want to take the longer path that gives you more time overall? Those kind of choices and that kind of on-the-fly routing, I think, is interesting. And I think because this is uh, procedurally generated and chunk-based, one of the, the core ideas is that people will kind of learn the chunks and how the chunks interact with each other and how that sort of merges new movement mechanics and things like that. And punishment, a very quick turnaround. So the game is based on tracking this radio signal. And the, the little clock with the, the number next to it is basically the strength of your signal. And when that hits zero, you're completely out of time. Um, but I have the, the macro punishment, and then I have the micro punishment. For the individual level chunks on the micro level, you end up going to the very start of the chunks. So you're able to really quickly bam, 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 bam. If you're having trouble, you get a lot of attempts, you, and you can try it out. If you've been doing well on the previous areas, you have more time to work with to make those mistakes, and it really helps level things out. Different people have trouble in different places. So if you consistently space out um, where you're acquiring the time, that means you've got some tension of, depending on where the procedures put these chunks, you've got the tension of, oh boy, I'm about to come across I, this is a chunk that I have trouble with, and there isn't a clock this time. What am I going to do? Um, versus in an actual run setting, if you have a highly skilled player that just happens to drop the ball during a marathon or something like that, and they're actually an incredibly well-versed or technical player, they're going to have some more, they're going to have a little bit of spare time. They can smooth it out a little bit over the course of the run. And then randomness. Uh, these are just two examples of how I'm generating the levels. Um, so you can kind of see the chunks a little bit. The little red square is the Unity camera. So in the uh, previous screens, well, the, cre the previous screens were actually smaller screenshots, but those, those squares are basically what you can see at one time. So these, you can see that these are stitching together quite a few, quite a few different chunks. Um, pretty interesting. Uh, you can have, uh, I didn't want it to be each chunk to appear too often. So you have these larger chunks that are more unique, but then you have uh, smaller chunks that are slightly less unique. But the point is, each chunk can only appear once per level. So each level is random, but across the zone, you'll see repeat chunks. The level, a zone consisting of uh, three or four levels, depending on which one it is. Um, but everything is seed-based. The seeds created right at the beginning. You're able to race these seeds. Multiple people are able to do it all at once. And I even have it set up so that you can have meme seeds. Like if you're doing, or maybe not meme seeds so much as uh, event seeds, because you're able to have, uh, I believe I set it up for 10 numbers and characters 
to put into the seed. So you could have, say, you had a GDC 2018 tournament. You could have the seed be GDC 2018 dash anything, or just GDC 2018, or ha ha, not 2018. And then the next seed be, you thought I'd do 2018, and then the last seed, but it's not, ha ha. I don't know, something weird like that. Bad joke, I apologize. Um, and everything's distant based with the hazards and stuff like that. So you can always um, plan out your route, you know exactly what's going to happen. When you see this chunk appear, you know what's going to happen, you've learned that chunk, and you can go through it. Plus with the whole tension of the clock always ticking down, then that means you always have that little bit of tension. Even if you know what you're doing, that omnipresent clock just lets you know exactly how much time you have left. And if you make a mistake, that tension just grows that much more. And you have the time to make mistakes, but the tension never goes away. And then no bosses, uh, everything's environmental hazards. Uh, there's going to be at least you know, two or three environmental mechanics per, per stage or per uh, zone. And it'll be, it'll be pretty interesting. Um, I brought a demo. It's going to be pretty cool. If you want to try it out, just come find me at the event. Um, it's on my laptop. I've been I've shown it off to a couple people. It's pretty neat. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, cycles as in like timing cycles and stuff? Yeah. So I think it should be um, room-based or like not global cycles, like trying to race that. Because then it just feels like you're, it's a coin toss of whether or not it's going to happen. Uh, with Radio Run, what I'm going to do is anytime there's any sort of cycle or restore, it's going to be based on when you enter the chunk. So when you're in the space where the cycle becomes relevant, that's where the timer starts. That's when the cycle's relevant. Um, then you can always play with that cycle. And possibly you even have the flexibility of setting up the cycles to either be slightly off or be slightly on or change the timing of your rotating platforms because that's the, that's the easiest one I can think of is you know, pillar drop cycles or something like that where you can, if you have this flexibility, if you have that kind of mechanic, and you want that control, if you put it as close to the event as possible, then you can more easily fine tune how you want those cycles to interact with each other. Any other questions? Nope. Cool. Oh, yes. Uh, we don't have a release date yet, but I'm aiming for next year, ideally for uh, AGDQ 2020 submissions, but no promises. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't done enough market research to say one way or the other, but hopefully around like five, ten bucks, but I actually don't know. Yes. My favorite kind of movement mechanic in a platformer? Probably hovering. <laughs> um, I, started with, I started with Gargoyle's Quest. It's a really weird speed run, but boy, do I feel at home every time I run out of stamina and just start screaming internally when I fall into a pit. <laughs> um, just the, the limitation of um, not perfect flight just really resonates with me for some reason. Like, uh, for instance, Owlboy, this is, this is my go-to example for uh, limitations versus fully powered, is Owlboy is a gorgeous, wonderful game that I recommend everybody play. But mechanically, I find it incredibly uninteresting because you can just fly anywhere. It might as well be a top-down shooter. But aesthetically, it looks gorgeous, and you should totally play the game, and it's amazing. But in terms of a limited hover mechanic that I'm used to and I enjoy versus just always being able to fly around, that inherent strength at the start of the game, I, I don't find very interesting. And yes. Uh, 
Um, I guess that really depends on the tension or the, the mood you're going for. Um, I think anything could make a good speed run. I think any aesthetic could make a good speed run. Um, I think that's really more of a, um, an artistic choice than a, than a speed running choice. Um, in terms of making it feel like a speed run, I think like a very like high tension, upbeat kind of soundtrack is, is really good. Um, in terms of a selling marketing perspective, um, a lot of speedrunners like retro games. <laughs> so um, that's, that definitely has a, a, some merit to it. Um, I know with Radio Run, with the original artistic vision, um, we were kind of going for SNES Plus, where kind of like Shovel Knight, where there's a there's a really good, I uh, can't remember the site off the top of my head, but you can probably Google for it. There's a really good article about Shovel Knight and how they took the NES color palette and the NES limitations as inspiration, but they didn't stick to them. So they used it as a jumping off point, but they were able to take advantage of modern hardware to do things like have more than two things scrolling at a time and have more than three sound channels, have HD graphics. Um, so even though it looks and feels a lot like a NES game because they did a really good job of it, um, they still took advantage of modern hardware. Yes. I think the more a player has played your game, I think the more you should reward that player, one way or the other. And just from your example, it takes a really long time to manipulate, say, a potion drop on a beach level of an unnamed game that someone may run in the front row. Um, versus oh, hey, I lost a world record to Arma 2 because he just didn't want to come down, and now I'm ranting and raving on the Discord. Um, you know, both of these things have happened. <laughs> and, yeah, I think that's what it really comes down to, is if someone's enjoying your game and someone's putting a lot of hours into it, um, mechanically, you should try to reward them. A lot of people reward players with things like achievements and things on top, stuff like that. Um, Celeste does a really good job of the more time you put into the game, the more stuff you find, the more stuff that unlocks. The more stuff that unlocks, the harder that challenge is. When you beat that stuff, it unlocks harder stuff. And then that's when people are like, okay, no, I'm done. Or people are like, no, 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 we're, we're, getting, we're getting all of it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my, that's my thoughts on that. Uh, one more question. Yeah, so Unity is really good with tutorials. Um, I started using Unity when I was in college, and I mostly just stuck with it. Um, basically, I had to pick a camp, Uni Unreal or Unity, and I just decided to go with Unity at the time because I was doing uh, C++ for my job at that just that point in my life, and I wanted to do C Sharp on the side because I'd done C++ and C Sharp, so I just wanted to keep both of those kind of fresh and interesting. Um, but Unity is very good for both public and private tutorials. Um, they used to do dev streams. I don't know if they do any more. I know they tend to do them a lot when a new, a new major version comes out. Um, but in terms of Radio Run, there's a tutorial. Can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Apologies. But just Google for Unity 2D Platformer Tutorial and go for the one on the official site. That one co covers a lot of the new mechanics from Unity 2017. Because, and funny story, the thing that inspired me to work on Radio Run and just go the full distance is because Unity now has a tile editor and it's really good. <laughs> uh, so that's the main motivation there. So hopefully that answers your question. And I think that's all we have time for. So thanks for showing up. I hope you found this informative.